Um, my name is Mike Bilapuhov. I work for uh, Asdenera Networks GmbH in uh, Hanover, Germany, and we produce um, networking appliances uh, based on OpenBSD. And today I'm going to talk about the uh, implementation of Zen uh, para virtualized drivers that um, I've been working on most of the last year and um, that I've committed, uh, I think in the late December, early January. And then, um, unfortunately, um, I haven't had a chance to uh, work on that code since then because I had to switch to do Hyper-V drivers that will hit the tree hopefully very soon. Um, but um, I have an, a bit of a, I, I gave it, gave this talk at Asia BusinessCon in Tokyo, and um, I hope that I would be able to update it a little bit. Um, but unfortunately, um, I had to do some other stuff and wasn't able to um, get back to this. However, I have a, one uh, new thing to talk about. So. And since the, uh, the video from that talk hasn't been released yet, um, we'll get something new to talk about. So the goal of the project was to produce a minimal, well-written, well-understood um, implementation of Zen para virtualized driver, drivers to be able to run in Amazon EC2. That's what we uh, need for our um, virtual appliances. And be able at the same time to fix problems for our customers. And this is where the challenge is to be actually able to fix problems. To, to, to be um, able to do that, we have to have intricate knowledge of the framework of, of drivers and um, to be able to uh, get back to our uh, customers in a timely manner. If you try to run OpenBSD in EC2 um, before these drivers were implemented, you would need to be able to boot, and that worked, you would be able, you need to be uh, able to mount the root partition to read your uh, kernel and then later the root file system. And it already works because EC2 uh, contains um, all the necessary so-called legacy drivers for the disk subsystem. However, uh, and um, of course you need to be able to support SMP. That unfortunately didn't work on AMD64, but was shortly fixed. Um, then you would need to be able to perform cloud in it. When you run on EC2, you do not have access to serial console or any other console emulation. Um, you need to be able to talk to your virtual machine via network. Cloud in it would run in the early stages of system boot process and fetch SSH keys for your instance uh, that you have set up during the, uh, inst uh, during the initialization of your instance. And... Um, set them up in the system so that you could log in uh, using those keys. But the problem here is that it requires to fetch them over the network, over HTTP, in fact. Amazon has a key distribution server in their infrastructure that serves those keys along with some additional data that you can put into your MI, or, or MI being the Amazon machine image. Now, that requires the paravirtualist net networking driver because Amazon EC2 does not provide you with a emulation. Then you need to be able to log in, to actually log in into your system, right? That didn't work e as well because you actually need the uh, networking driver. We started with, I started looking at the FreeBSD implementation and what immediately you realize when you're looking at that code is that it's huge. Uh, DU says that it's 1.5 megabytes in size. 
while uh, right now it's only 124 kilobytes in OpenBSD. 35 C files, 83 headers. In OpenBSD, our implementation fits into only four C files and two headers. It's extremely complex. Uh, a lot of APIs uh, that are implemented there are needlessly uh, overblown. The interrupt handling is, uh, well, I, the, the, I must say that the FreeBSD sub, uh, interrupt subsystem is kind of nice, but it requires you to write a lot of stop code, and the code that doesn't really mean anything, it just has to be there because of the framework. Uh, since we do not share the same framework with FreeBSD, that has to be uh, rewritten. The guest initialization itself is a rather simple task in Zen. It's about four functions, but the problem is that they're all over the place in the FreeBSD tree, and it makes you go and chase function calls, so on and so forth. The other problem uh, that I've noticed was the clash of coding practices. Since uh, FreeBSD code uh, reuses some of the uh, Linux uh, uh, code written, uh, written by the original authors of then and then the later by people who uh, maintained that code, uh, you would see code that is might be a normal thing in Linux, but we do not do this in FreeBSD this way, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of questionable abstractions. Uh, what, some of the examples are huge code generation markers, like the defined ring types that uh, basically provides you with a pre-written uh, producer-consumer interface for your uh, networking rings, um, and a whole bunch of other things. The Zen store is the uh, Zen, uh, a facility in Zen to provide virtual machine with some properties. Uh, for instance, uh, most of the device, most of the para-virtualized devices are presented to the uh, guest VM as a set of uh, Zen store properties. The FreeBSD API tends to support all of the features, even if they're not needed, even if they're not used, and most of that code comes directly from Zen. And one of the good examples is access directory, the function that essentially lists uh, one subtree in that Zen store hierarchy and de uh, reads, reads the source, the, the values um, of pro uh, stores the property names in a dynamically allocated arrays and so on and so forth. Um, doing a lot of string manipulation within the kernel. Uh, some other methods are using SS kind of to parse uh, single digit numbers and so on and so forth. So porting was not really an option. Uh, instead, we decided to do uh, a very sim to have a, to, to, to use a very simple uh, s single device driver model where we would have one device driver we call a Nexus that would initialize the guest services and provide all these facilities like Zen Store to other consumers and then look for and attach the paravirtualized device drivers. Thankfully, uh, Rike has implemented a um, pseudo bus, a, a, a little bit of framework, a little bit of the glue code that runs very early in the system boot. Um, it looks at the CPU flux, it finds the hypervisor, uh, if, it figures out if there's a hypervisor, then runs through a hypervisor signature check method to figure out which hypervisor are we running under, and then attaches the uh, appropriate Nexus device or devices, because um, it seems like the, um, these hypervisor guys are going into the direction of hot uh, VM migration where then people would implement the Hyper-V uh, compatibility layer and to the guest system, to the OpenBSD, it would appear like we are running under two hypervisors at the same time. 
So therefore, the PV bus provides us with a method of attaching multiple Nexus devices. So we could initialize Zen, Hyper-V, and so on and so forth. The Zen Nexus device um, attaches other paravirtual devices, as I said. For instance, the net front interface, which is called XNF. Uh, these lines come from the kernel configuration files and describe the um, device drive attachments in our auto configuration subsystem. So let's take a quick look how do we initialize the um, HVM guess. HVM means that this is a hardware assisted virtualization as opposed to power virtualized hosts which require modifications to the virtual memory subsystem and uh, uh, different power virtualized IPI calls and so on and so forth. The HVM uh, leverages the facilities provided by the CPU like EMT for, for, for uh, um, nested page table support and so on and so forth allowing us to run unmodified guests. The paravirtualized drivers themselves provide an uh, increased performance over the uh, fully virtualized devices. So the hypercore interface is one of the, uh, uh, the first things the guest needs to set up. Uh, the hypercore is a, just a function call that um, uh, performs a, 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 um, a call instruction on a, on a page that is provided by the hypervisor. The API for this is, is uh, in, in Zen, uh, in, in Linux and in FreeBSD, is to define uh, a function per every type of a hypercall. There are about 20 or 30 hypercalls in Zen and only about, a f uh, only about five or, uh, or so in Hyper-V, although I think we are using only three or two hypercalls in Hyper-V. But in, in Zen, there is about 20 or 30 hypercalls, and all of them have a different, uh, basically an implementation in, in, in FreeBSD. In OpenBSD, instead, we use only one function that takes variable arguments. I actually uh, have another function that takes an um, like an argv structure, the uh, array of pointers, but um, it turned out that it's much easier for me and for others to just use this, the variable argument uh, method and call whatever we want through one uh, API function. So if we take a look at the hypercall page itself, uh, it all starts with the kernel t uh, code segment. This bit is put into the low core. It allocates a page of uh, memory uh, within the kernel code segment, but doesn't put anything there except for knobs. Actually, this is a, I forgot to, I must admit, I, must, I forgot to update this slide. We are filling it now with a, a CC instruction, which is an in three. In fact, when the hypervisor maps this page in, it uh, also fills all the blanks with CC, which is a uh, debugging interrupt. Uh, if you execute this instruction, you get to the DDB, essentially. That's how we handle it. Now, this is stored in the kernel ELF. This is what is put on the disk. We just locate a uh, one page, four kilobytes of memory, and, and that's stored on the disk. When the kernel is loaded and we, ex we find the address of this page in the kernel uh, virtual memory and then extract the physical address of this page, we supply it into the hypervisor through an MSR, memory, uh, machine specific register, and then the, the, the hypervisor then maps in its own code into that page. And the code that it maps is basically just a uh, one instruction, SGDT, that doesn't do really anything by, def by default, but provides a VM exit event uh, that the hypervisor catches and then expects the arguments. The next uh, bit that needs to be initialized is a shared information page that contains information about uh, event channels, which is a representation of interrupts. We'll take a look at that shortly. 
And then uh, after we've done that, we need to initialize the interrupt subsystem. To do that, we basically need to allocate one interrupt descriptor table slot. And uh, we should be doing that dynamically, however, uh, to, uh, f f uh, to be able to, to move forward faster with this, I, ha I actually pre-allocate the slot uh, right now. Uh, I, the, the IDT contains 256 entries, and I uh, pick the value, which is uh, 70 hacks. It's the, uh, it says here, start of the IPL net section. What this means is that our IDT table is basically uh, segmented logically into different IPL levels, and the um, IPL net section uh, starts with 70. This means that this interrupt is an IPL interrupt, IPL net interrupt. This is important because we want to do uh, pending interrupts. Then interrupts in FreeBSD and cannot be uh, masked unless you disable interrupts altogether. Uh, in OpenBSD, it's not like that. We, uh, I have implemented all the needed steps, which uh, includes the actual uh, interrupt vector, inter then up call, as well as two other methods called recurse and resume to be able to uh, hold off the interrupt delivery until the IPL level drops and then resume the uh, then interrupt up call. This is, this is how all our other um, interrupt vectors are implemented and I haven't seen uh, the need to do, uh, to do it differently. Uh, this essentially allowed me to use printf in the, in the Zen interrupt handler um, that um, rises the IPL to IPL high, preventing further interrupts from coming. Now, once we, once, we, once we allocated the IDT slot number, we have to communicate this with the hypervisor. The alternative method of delivering Zen uh, interrupts is the so-called Zen source platform PCI device uh, that is, is a PCI device that appears on the emulated PCI bus that we can attach to, set up the PCI interrupt, and uh, use that instead. We support it as a backup option in case we cannot, uh, for some reason, communicate the IDT vector. Then we would allocate another one for this PCI device driver and try with uh, set, uh, setting up instead. Uh, however, I've been told that it's not really necessary, but I mean, it's already done. Um, instead of doing, uh, there was no real possibility to port the interrupt uh, system, the interrupt subsystem from FreeBSD. Instead, I had to basically roll my own, and um, I figured that I can get away with just four functions that look similar to other interrupt establishing functions found on other architectures. Uh, interrupt establish takes event channel port if it's already known or zero if it's not assigned. Um, it returns the Zen interrupt handle T, which is in this implementation the same as event channel port. So basically, if you don't know which event channel port you want to bind your device to, uh, Zen interrupt established will allocate one for you and uh, return back the value. This is basically the, the way to um, to identify which device have generated which event. It's done by this uh, event channel port. All the event channel port, ports, uh, they basically form a matrix that we have to go through in the interrupt handler, figuring out which bit is set. And whenever we figure out the um, position of that bit, that is the event channel port of the interrupting device. Uh, this establish mask and unmask. Pretty simple. The event fun out, the, uh, meaning the uh, going th from this single uh, IDT uh, interrupt vector to the 
actual interrupt handler of the parabolic device driver, we need to implement this fan out, this looking through the um, matrix of the uh, event channel ports. Uh, we perform a very simple uh, while loop with shift, figure out uh, which bit uh, is set, look up the interrupt source, and then call the associated interrupt handler with the associated interrupt handler argument. This code in, uh, one, one of the reasons why I decided that it makes sense to um, start from scratch is, base, is, is the quality of Zen code. Uh, this loop that I implemented is about two times shorter than the, uh, the loop in FreeBSD while doing absolutely the same thing. Um, so what's, what else is needed for the para-virtualized device driver? Zen store. We need to read the device properties. We need to know which MAC address is assigned to which interface and so on and so forth. Zen store is a shared ring with a producer-consumer interface. We have a one kilobyte buffer for uh, reading messages, one kilobyte buffer for writing messages, and we have a, a set of producer-consumer indexes that um, in this shared memory. It's driven by interrupts, meaning that we uh, send the request and then interrupt happens and then we read the response back out of this queue. And it exchanges null terminated ASCII strings um, as opposed to binary protocol. Well, um, I must say that the, 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 the meaning of this is, uh, well, well, I mean, the well, few examples of this ASCII null terminated strings include uh, POSIX errors represented as strings. For instance, e inval returned to you as a string or e access returned to you as a string, MAC address returned to you as a string, all numbers are returned to you as a string and need to be converted into integers. This is the uh, first, or oh, nearly the first uh, subsystem that actually requires an A to Y implementation. The Zen story uh, exposes a hierarchical file system like structure where uh, you have nodes, sub nodes like this. And for instance, the, the sub node, this is a device tree, uh, part of the device tree for the virtual interface zero. And it has a link to the back end, which is also stored in the same Zen, so Zen store tree, but the guest does not have access to, the, to all of the nodes on the local domain slash zero, because that's the subtree of the domain zero. Uh, there is a permission system in place, and only, uh, only some nodes are um, Available, available for a uh, guest system to be read. For instance, the, uh, the backend of the um, networking interface is one of them. So what can we find in the, in the backend for the virtual int uh, networking interface? Um, a lot of things, for instance, feature flags, like feature scatter gather, feature um, uh, the TCP upload, TCP uploading features, and so on and so forth. Some of the options um, have to be set by the front end driver. Um, and um, like for instance, the, the checksumming features. Some of the checksumming features are actually assumed to, to have some values and are not represented in the backend tree by default. But uh, the driver needs to announce them on its own. So if you take a look at the, um, how we do device discovery and attachment, it's basically we have this auto concept system that uh, we call in a loop and we traverse this tree. And for every device that we think we want to attach a driver, we call the uh, special function config attach. 
And config attach goes through all of the configuration tree and calls matching functions for every configured driver. So for instance, XNF is configured to be found on, on, the, uh, um, on the Zen zero parent node. Therefore, it will be attached as XNF zero, so on and so forth, XNF one. Same with the uh, block devices. Um, so basically, this means that we now can get to the power virtualist driver. But in fact, we need one more thing. We need to be able to share memory between a uh, power virtualist device driver and the um, domain zero. The ring, that, for instance, the receive ring of the networking interface is a circular buffer uh, that is that contains multiple descriptors and consumer producer indices. I wouldn't go far into details. I'm just gonna scroll through this and basically show how we go from um, the beginning of the ring to the beginning of the ring. Uh, and every descriptor points to a chunk of physical memory, points to a buffer. Uh, what we, that we call cluster, an MBuff cluster. MBuff cluster is located somewhere in the physical memory, for instance, at the address 4000 hex. It's also mapped into a virtual memory where you can MMCPI data, for instance, the virtual address triple uh, four four thousand hex. This mapping is done by the uh, MMU. The way we um, is to manage this type of memory and mappings is through the bus DMA interface that was uh, created by Jason Thorpe for NetBSD project and since then it has been ported to OpenBSD and FreeBSD. And the way we use bus DMA is basically you create a memory layout like that descriptive table that you saw before um, that has fixed size, fixed number of segments and every segment uh, points to a uh, physical chunk of memory. It would be really nice to use this bus DMA API for uh, managing those rings for the power virtualized driver uh, to allow to allocate memory, map to map it into the kernel virtual space. This is the example of um, mapping a, a buffer that uh, is that is two pages long that is backed by two different non-contiguous pages. And this is transparent to the uh, process doing MemCPI into the buffer on the kernel side because the virtual memory is contiguous. However, it's backed by non-contiguous memory. And this is what bus DMA allows us to manage. Um, this, is, this is an example of how we do it. So multi. Uh, Every, every um, entry on the map can have multiple segments pointing to different chunks of physical memory while representing the same um, contiguous buffer in the virtual memory. So NetFront, the power virtual devices, uh, device drivers, RIX ring is just a, a bunch of these descriptors and a bunch of uh, consumer uh, producer indices. The each descriptor can represent a request when you put the uh, this uh, descriptor on the ring, or a response when you take it off the ring. They 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 have slightly different um, format, but otherwise the equivalent. The The problem with using the D bus DMA uh, interface with um, NetFront Rx rings it, uh, lays in the uh, in the uh, fact that while we do have a physical address um, of the of the of the 
buffer that we want to send to the hypervisor, we can not send it directly because Zen does not talk in this case in uh, terms of physical addresses. Instead, it um, requires us to use a mechanism called grant table pages or grant tables. And grant table represent a kind of a simple version of an MMU where we have entries that set permissions for different memory regions, actually page sized memory regions. So it's, it's a, another kind of a page table, a flat page table that points to uh, page sized buffers of physical memory where we can set permissions like read and write is allowed for a specific domain, for instance, domain zero. Now, the problem here is that bus DMA uh, is an abstraction layer. So wouldn't it be nice to use this abstraction layer and abstract the grant table uh, page internals uh, uh, with the bus DMA? So when we, whenever we want to um, load a buffer into the bus DMA map, we call this function bus DMA map load that extracts the phys physical addresses. But what we really need to do is we need to create references, and references being the ground table entry indices. For instance, uh, this, is, this is how it's organized. Once we load the buffer, we know the physical address. Then we have to go and allocate grant table uh, entries and point to individual pages. And the indices of these entries serve as references to uh, pages uh, of the underlying uh, contiguous buffer. So the way we do it, uh, the way I do it uh, in, in OpenBSD is that I uh, create custom uh, ropers for BuzzDMA methods because BuzzDMA interface actually allows us to do that. And BuzzDMA interface has a few cookies, um, few cookie pointers set in the uh, few core data structures that allow us to pass objects of undefined type to the bus DMA methods uh, without, without breaking the, the API. So I override a few uh, bus DMA uh, methods. And uh, once we call a bus DMA map, map, the bus DMA map create, we create the, the layout for the, for the uh, descriptor. I can also create a, a, a small structure that would hold pre-allocated references from the grant table. Once we are done with um, uh, once we preallocated these um, references and we loaded the uh, buffer into the memory, we can punch in the uh, real addresses that BuzzDMA load returned to us. We punch them into the references, grant table entries. Uh, entries. We activate those entries so, uh, to, to let the uh, remote domain know that we have provided, the, um, provided access to those uh, pages to the remote domain. And then we can use the references that we, uh, that, that we have had preallocated instead of the physical addresses and put them instead of the physical addresses on the, uh, uh, into the Rix ring uh, descriptor. So we basically cheat by um, using a standard BSD API, but make it operate with references instead of physical addresses. 
once we un un and the unloading goes just in the opposite direction, we go through our uh, small reference tables, disable those entries, uh, get back our uh, physical addresses that we have recorded, and put them back for the bus DMA uh, subsystem, and that's it, and we are done. Uh, once, we, uh, once we don't need the map, we can call the bus DMA map free. That would just destroy those, uh, or rather release those uh, ground table entries back to the ground table page pool. The way you announce, once you set up those rings, the way you announce them is that you create a, uh, a reference for the ring itself, separate ground table entry. You take that reference number, and you convert it to a string and send over Zen store to the uh, hypervisor as a an, uh, as an value of Rx ring reference property. Same for TX. So that is basically all that paravirtualized NetFront driver needs to do. So now we can uh, go and run in EC2. We can obtain an SSH key. Um, we can connect to the uh, to the to the to the machine, um, and the this procedure is uh, that is called cloud init is uh, requires us uh, to basically let the OpenBSD do that for us, configure the DHCP, get the keys, and so on and so forth on the uh, first boot. The, during the development, the, uh, the uh, uh, development images were published by Reich and Antoine in, the, uh, in different uh, availability zones in the EC2 cloud. And Antoine um, actually helped us and provide the scripts that would create those images with all this, uh, with, with a simple cloud init like uh, initialization. Um, uh, to be used in EC2. And this is uh, something new that uh, popped up recently. Uh, one of our users uh, reported that we didn't uh, run under the Cubes OS correctly. Cubes OS, for those who do not know, is, is a new uh, security-oriented operating system that runs a, a Zen on top of real hardware. It has multiple domains, and then what happens is that it chains them. So for instance, when you want a firewall domain, well, or, or rather a firewall functionality on your KubeOS, you spawn, a, instead of configuring IP tables, you spawn a VM that you know, uh, has IP chains or IP tables or whatever, and then you push the traffic through that VM into the, your destination VM where you run, for instance, a browser. Well, they run the browser in another VM. So you run all these VMs. You run uh, you know, your control VM. Then you run the VM with the browser. Then you run the VM with the firewall. And then your traffic goes into the VM with the firewall. From, and from the VM uh, with the firewall, it goes into the VM with the browser. So for instance, sorry? OK. Um, so we didn't, uh, we, we, we could boot in that, um, in, 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 instead of a firewall VM, I think uh, he tried the firewall VM, we could boot there, but the network didn't work. When I looked at uh, some debugging outputs, it became clear that the, 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 the networking interface was connected not to the domain zero, but to the main, for instance, two. That means that we need to pass the backend domain number to all of the uh, ground table interface and the uh, interrupt um, establishing interface. And we need to specify that we are, getting, we are giving this pay access to these pages to the remove domain number two, while before we gave access only to domain zero. Uh, it was not configurable. And we need to bind the event channel to the correct remove domain. Once that was done, that didn't work. 
for some reason. We got this cryptic message that uh, the, the ground table reference was held by the domain. The domain wouldn't give us our memory back. And a bit of debugging um, led me to uh, essentially a one-line div um, where I would forget to take the domain ID into account because, because it was zero. When I was uh, performing an atomic cast of the flags field on the ground table entry to disable the uh, read or write access bit. Once that was done, uh, it could uh, communicate via network just fine. Um, however, in KubeOS, the configuration of those VMs does not happen through SSH. It happens through a shared memory pages that uh, are, and there's a bunch of libraries that uh, uh, whole infrastructure written to, to use that interface. And the shared memory pages are configured via the uh, hypercalls issued from the user land via the device node. So the library just isn't basically a, a, a shim on top of the IOCTL interface for a Zen uh, device node. This is unfortunately not ported and, uh, to OpenBSD and I personally consider it to be a strange de design decision. I would expect them to rather use network, uh, like, like for instance, uh, Amazon is using HTTP, they could do the same, they could set up an HTTP server and then you can just fetch whatever configuration you wanna fetch. I mean, all you need to fetch is basically an IP address, I would assume, or oh, maybe policy, okay. But still, uh, the point is that doing that through shared memory seems like a bit of a, excessive approach. The future work, uh, what, what do we wanna do in the future? Um, the time counter would be nice, it shouldn't be too hard, uh, but uh, I've started working on it, however the other guy have picked up the PV clock uh, uh, subsystem and, and he will. He wanted to do the KVM driver and other driver and, uh, because PV clock is basically a, a kind of a common standard for the time counters across uh, multiple hypervisors. And I basically want to chip in and, and uh, do the Zen bit. Um, the suspend and resume. We have a, a, a method that handles the uh, was it shutdown reboot events, but we don't have the suspend resume support yet. Uh, driver from, for the uh, disk, the, the virtual disk, we don't need that in EC2 unless we want to use um, non-root disk images. And to be honest, we do really want to use uh, multiple disk images. Uh, so this is kind of a priority uh, for me. Um, Eventually, we'll have to look in the PCI pass-through because large uh, EC2 instances use 10 controllers and uh, they provide virtual functions into the VM directly. Uh, I would like to thank um, Riken as the NERA for sponsoring this work and OpenBSD developers for uh, productive discussions and uh, code reviews. There has been a lot of uh, effort spent on this and um, this wouldn't be possible without the FreeBSD code, the Linux code, and special thanks go to Valu and Roger Pomo uh, from Citrix for answering questions and uh, just being cool with me, you know, taking credit for all that stuff. Questions? Please. So the question is uh, whether uh, we have run into issues uh, w where uh, Amazon Zen version would diverge from whatever I use for development. I actually use 4.5 on Ubuntu. Um, and yes, uh, they use a, their own branch, their own fork of Zen. It has 
some differences. Um, one of the early things we have noticed is that we have to disable uh, X2APIC. X2APIC is a new standard for advanced programmable interrupt controller, and we have to disable that on, the, on EC2. However, it works just fine on, on 4.5. So that's one thing. The other thing is that recently there was a week-long outage for all FreeBSD and NetBSD AMIs on uh, EC2 uh, because of some changes to the bootloader, but um, they reverted that. But it was a, essentially a week-long outage where nobody with FreeBSD, oh, sorry, uh, NetBSD or OpenBSD AMI could boot their instances. Any other questions, please? Good question. Um, the cloud init uh, bit that I was talking about is actually a project. Uh, I think it's a canonical project, something like that. Uh, and it outputs host keys on the terminal when boots, uh, uh, upon boot. Uh, you see them when, you, when the script runs, you, you can see the output on the console. Amazon provides a read-only uh, console output. You have to go into your instance properties and uh, search for, uh, I forgot how it's called, but it's kind of obvious. It's like a console log or something like that. And then you see the, the host keys. So you have to output them there so that you could check and verify and so on and so forth. Right, uh, there's also a set of tools that Amazon publishes, it's called um, AWS CLI. That you, uh, it, it's a Python program and you can install it. We have a port in OpenBSD thanks to Antoine. And uh, you can use that to interact with, your, with, with the EC2 in general, uh, OS3. It supports maybe not everything, but a lot of uh, Amazon stack. And um, you can get the output the console output with this command line tool as well. Uh, and I, I have to mention that we're not using the, the official full cloud in it project on Canonical. Right. We, we use Antoine's self project. We he replaced it with a simple self project. Right, right. Uh, yes, please. So the question is, um, what do I do uh, regarding the Hyper-V drivers uh, on OpenBSD, given that there are already uh, FreeBSD drivers available? The, uh, I'm, I'm porting. Um, this time it's not a rewrite, although uh, due to massive differences, I actually have to make changes. But um, I kind of keep the APIs compatible, more or less. Uh, some of the code remains. Uh, however, quite a bit of code is new. I'm not sure. Does that answer the question? Okay, yeah. any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much.